Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is probably one of the most basic thing about one of the most basic things that churches do, hmm. which is this combination of evangelism and discipleship. And I have with me on my left and right two veterans of foreign wars. Okay, uh, people who've been in the ministry for a long time, who have um, given of themselves uh, to serve the Lord, and now. Uh, are in a in a different kind of phase of life and and with a ministry that has grown out of that experience. Mm. So to my left is Ken Horton, who's president of Ministry Catalyst, and to my right is John Tolson, mm -hmm. who uh, works with a group called the Tolson Group that works in evangelism and discipleship. And so we're just going to talk about. Um, Really, the pursuit that every Christian should have, which is mm. to grow in maturity and in wisdom and knowledge of the Lord, okay. as uh, God walks alongside them in their spiritual life. So I'm gonna. I'm, I always ask. I, you know, you guys are kind of the, your initial effort with us. I always ask the same question uh, to open with a group of people, and that is, um, mm. what do nice guys like you do getting in a gig like this? So, yeah. Ken, I'll start with you. <clears throat> Well, I trusted Christ 60-plus years ago. Mm -hmm. I understood the gospel, understood I was forgiven, going to heaven, spent a number of years in a church that gave me a bunch of things to do, and I did pretty good at them, mm -hmm. uh, but created a, an environment of uncertainty about just what it meant to enjoy being a Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to Auburn, mm -hmm. God had already done some work, but I began to work through a process with Camps Crusade that... But mm -hmm. let me take the first steps toward learning about living by faith. Mm -hmm. That was a really critical part of my journey. I spent some time in the Air Force, which was critical for me to learn how to enjoy being with people that weren't Christians. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I tell people I learned as much in my three years in the Air Force as I learned in my years at Dallas Seminary about ministering to people who were going to be in environments with people that didn't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, Finished the time in the Air Force, came to Dallas Seminary, uh, was involved in ministry here, and uh, have had a decades-long ministry in youth ministry as a senior pastor, and uh, was involved as the chaplain of the TCU football team for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And in that process, I began to wrestle through some things about my own life, mm -hmm. just that I was having a fruitful ministry but was not enjoying it nearly as much as I hmm. thought I would have. Hmm. And as I wrestled through that, it dawned on me that you can do what God wants you to do. And if you're doing it in the flesh, mm -hmm. it may be impressive to people and even encouraging to yourself on some level, but it's not going to be very joyful. Hmm. And it won't be pleasing to God. And so that process in my own heart began to to move me in a direction to try to think through what it looked like to live in a posture of dependence on God so that I could actually enjoy the relationship that I had with Him since hmm. I was a child. Hmm. And so our discipleship resource is unpacking that hmm. process, how to begin by faith and live by faith in a way that uh, your relationship with God is, is intentionally dependent and you're able to be involved with people in a mm -hmm. way that allows you to f stay focused on being a blessing to them rather than impressing them. Oh, wow. So yeah. um, so yeah. I take it you were in Fort Worth for a long period of time? I've been in Fort Worth since 1984. Okay. Wow. Very good. So I was in Greensboro before that where I met my wife. In Greensboro, North Carolina? I was. Worked with a guy you knew uh, there, and David Crennell. Dave Crennell, sure. You and I have a common ground there. Oh, so. wow. So Westover Presbyterian? Yeah, was there. That's, wow. where, I That's where I did my internship. That's oh, where I met right. my wife. First night I was there. <laughs> I, made, I had a rule. Small world. I had a rule that I wasn't going to date any women in the church because I knew that could go sideways. Uh -huh. And when I met her on the way home, I said, this is not going to end well. <laughs> I was so much sure, for that rule. I'm pretty sure that rule was going to end well. 
Yeah, yeah. I, uh, that's a whole other conversation. We'll, we'll pursue that process later. I love it. Anyway, that's beautiful. That's, so, John, how did a nice guy like you get into, into a gig like this? Tell us your story. Well, I uh, was uh, born in Ohio, mm-hmm. and my mom and dad divorced when I was two years old, and I never met my father mm-hmm. uh, and had no recollection of him. A stepfather came into my life when I was about seven. Hmm. He had no idea mm-hmm. how to be um, a father. Uh, I had a crazy uncle in Ohio who was a phenomenal athlete, hmm. and he uh, showed me at a very young age how to shoot a basketball and throw a baseball. Hmm. My now stepdad made fun of that. He said, it's stupid, mm-hmm. stupid to spend your time playing ball. Mm-hmm. The other little side is that no one in my family had ever gone past the 10th grade in school. Hmm. Uh, good people, mm-hmm. not necessarily followers of Jesus, mm-hmm. but good people, uh, but they were not highly motivated. Hmm. They worked either on a ranch, a farm, steel mill, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But they just weren't highly motivated. But something in me, hopefully I trust it was, it was the Lord, was saying, you gotta, you got to break that chain. Hmm. So I had an amazing opportunity. It's a whole other session for mm-hmm. us, the story of how this happened. But I had a chance to go to school in Arizona to play basketball and baseball. Mm. My family moved to Florida when I was about the third or fourth grade. Mm. So I made it to college. When mm-hmm. I graduated, I signed a contract uh, to coach in a college in Mississippi mm. um, that summer. My, and I had come to know Christ going into the 10th grade year in high school, and it was real. Mm-hmm. It was real, real, real. Mm. And anyway, my church in Florida was asking me to run this youth work that summer, and we had kids coming to Christ right and left from all over the city. And I said to a friend, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to coach. Mm-hmm. So he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do this. I want to work with these students. And anyway, he said, why don't you go to seminary? I said, what's that? He said, well, that's where you go. You want to be a preacher? I said, I don't want to be a preacher. I just want to help kids know Christ and get in the Scripture and live it out every day in their life. So anyway, I ended up going to seminary. And then over the next 15 years, worked with students in churches. And then when I was here in Dallas back in the uh, mid to late 70s, uh, I had a question fall out of a folder that I hadn't written down two years before, Hmm. and the question said, literally fell out of a a folder, I was looking for something. A folder? What in the world is that? No, it was a folder. I know. (laughs) I got one with me right here, baby. I'm big on folders. But anyway, uh, the question I had written down a couple years before, if you could do anything you wanted to do, knew you couldn't fail and money weren't a problem, what would you do? So I started for a couple months writing down what was in my heart, using the gifts God had given me, past experiences, needs that I saw around the country, et cetera. Anyway, out of all that, an incredible story, another another session, Mm -hmm. I was able to go, uh, a group of men uh, asked my wife and I to come and our family to come to Houston and do what I had written on one piece of paper to summarize everything I'd written down for a couple months. And they said, if you'd like to come, do what's on that paper. We'll take care of you. Hmm. So I went to Houston for five years and was freed up. Houstonians are like that, you know. Huh? Houstonians are like that. I know. They kind of let let her rip and let her roar. Yeah, exactly right. I'm from So I was able to do that. And then a group in Orlando said, would you come and help us do that in Orlando? Because Orlando's getting ready to pop, Mm -hmm. and we're trying to lay a base of leadership in the city as the growth comes. So we were there for 20 years. Mm. And then about uh, 20 years ago – a group of men in here in Dallas said, would you come back to Dallas and do what you're doing in Orlando and what you did in Houston? So basically what I do is help men come to know Christ, get them grounded in the faith, in the book, and to train and equip them to replicate in others what I have done with them. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to do some math. How long have you been in ministry, Ken? 1976, so... What, so Forty something years. Forty six years. Okay, forty six years. That's good. You did that pretty quick. Thirty two. Um, yeah, he's doing the math. You got enough. Fifty four. You got. You don't have enough fingers and <laughs> fingers and toes to get there. Huh? Long time. Yeah. Started in sixty sixty eight, and now it's twenty twenty two. So my so my point here is is that you all have been uh, 
seeking to minister to people and train them in the areas of discipleship and growth for yes, a sir. long, long time. A lot of experience. Yeah, both of us have. Yeah. So let me let me let me start let me start here. Um, and John, I'll start with you first. Sure. Um, what do you see as the biggest obstacles that people have in in their pursuit of the Lord? What gets in the way? Well, uh, and I and I won't call this disciple making okay. uh, replication. Just okay. their personal life and right. I think number one, um, they don't have the help that mm-hmm. they need uh, individually or in a more um, intimate small setting to understand what God wants from them. Mm-hmm. Number one, what does he expect after you get your ticket punched? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, as a result of not knowing the big picture, they then don't have the hands-on help from somebody to guide them and lead them. I mean, I can put a person in a room that someone has built their life into and discipled them, and I can put another person who knows the Lord mm-hmm. next to them who has not been uh, exposed to somebody walking with them and discipling them, and in five minutes I can tell you which one has been discipled which one hadn't. Interesting. I think there's a lack I – th- well, there's a lot of other reasons. I think people, because they haven't made that a priority mm-hmm. in their life, they let everything distract them okay. and pull away from them, yep. et cetera, et cetera. So those are a few things. Okay. And so I take it that what you're talking about here is pretty small group-based? Is that – Actually, that? actually uh, – and the and I'll mention the priorities in a little okay. bit when we get to that point. Yeah, but sure. I think every person that knows Christ ought to be in a little huddle uh, or a core with three or four people uh, that are encouraging one another to follow Christ and live the faith out. But the discipling we work on is one on one. Okay. So people so it's are very small group. <laughs> very small. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yes, um, sir. So. So Ken, I mean, he's mentioned some of the things that get in the way, and one of the things is they don't get the big picture. I think the question I want to ask you, because we're talking about evangelism and discipleship, mm-hmm. um, and I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there and get your reaction. Um, I often say that we tend to share the gospel starting from Genesis 3, and we need to share the gospel starting from Genesis 1. And the point that I want to make is, is that, is that if a person doesn't understand who they're designed to be and the way in which they have, God has made them, and we just start with the sin story, we have missed actually where God is planning to take them on the other end of the salvation uh, decision, if I can cast it that way. What do you think? Our first session is about how to begin a relationship with Christ. Mm-hmm. And the first point is that you have a purpose, mm-hmm. Genesis 1 and 2, and mm-hmm. that purpose is to enjoy intimate fellowship with God in this life mm-hmm. and for all eternity. Okay. And you and and so that purpose shapes the 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 perspective of, of what God wants to do in your life. So I, I, I like to say the church gets what it pays for when it shares the gospel. <laughs> and so if I share the gospel in such a way that I make it sound like it's an insurance policy about not going yeah. to somewhere, yeah. okay, not that's very warm and for a very long time and very uncomfortable, yeah. uh, that once that person checks that box, they think they're done, yeah. okay? But uh, if you present the gospel in the way in which it's offered, which is it is the restoration of something, of a relationship you were designed to have, yeah. you know, and, and you were created for eternity from the beginning. With right. this in mind, yeah. exactly yeah. right. That that's really the best starting point to have in thinking yeah. about. So, so I guess the question that that raises is, as, as, we, as we think about sharing with people, and I, this is a question that I raise because I think in, a, in the pluralistic environment that we live in, mm-hmm. um, we are, uh, people are hearing all kinds of voices and choices. Now, I'm thinking about people outside the church. So people who've never darkened the door of a church, they're, and they're, they're trying to make their life, to, what's the point of my life, et cetera. I, that's very dislocating. I compare it to a bazaar, you know, a mm-hmm. Middle Eastern bazaar that has a lot of booze or a lot of station. It's like a mall. And I say, and some of the booze are pretty bizarre, mm-hmm. you know, and that you've got this tension that you're dealing with here. And so all those voices, it's like all this static coming at you trying to make sense out of what your life is. And people will use language outside the church that I'm trying to find myself. I'm going, well, of course you're trying to find Most people yourself. go to Aspen to find themselves. I don't know why they go up there. <laughs> but, you know, so there's this sense of dislocation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 
I think one of the ways into thinking about the gospel for people today is the, is the idea that when you think about a relationship with God, that will give you a location and a sense of who you are. And you've got a problem. Sure. Right, right. And, yeah. and the problem, yeah. and if we don't put a proper emphasis on the problem, it's bad, right. and it's even worse than bad because yeah. we can't fix it. Exactly right. In a world that's basically universalist, everybody's going to go to heaven yeah, because right. God's too good to send anybody to hell. Right. In that world, yeah. if, we, if we don't make the problem clear, right. then the provision of God and Jesus Christ is not going to be nearly as convincing and clear as it needs to be. Okay, that's fair. So, so you move from Genesis one to Genesis three, if I can say it that that's, way. That's exactly right. And the right. problem for sin, but you've got that Genesis one in the background because this is who you're designed to be. This gets in the way. Mm-hmm. You can't fix it yourself. Among other things that you're talking about, I always tell people that the gospel is about something that's intention. It's about it's about the challenge on the one hand, which is the problem, but it's also about the invitation to experiencing to experiencing something that is far greater than the problem that you have if you'll step into it. And this is this gets to the enjoyment and the joy. This is why I remind people the gospel is called good news. It's called good news for a reason, not because we're going to park on the challenge, yeah. but because we're going to park on the solution. Yeah. And so if if we think about the gospel in that kind of way, and I'm glad we're talking about the gospel before we get to discipleship, the point that I'm trying to make is uh, hmm. And then I want your reaction to is is that how we set up talking about the gospel sets up the person for the journey they have on the other end. No question. And you begin that relationship with God by faith, hmm. and you continue that fellowship with God by faith. That's I mean, right. there's great continuity, and obviously a disciple that's not intentionally looking for opportunities to share the gospel with people hmm. is not involved in the kind of fruitful discipleship God wants him to have, be so, part of. So, so yeah. when we're, I mean, and if you think about this, the language that we have, although it seems strange to someone who's just coming into understanding and hearing about this, you talk about a relationship with God, and of course, people will go, "Well, okay, God, you know, I can't see him, I can't hug him in one sense." So, um, so what does that look like? How do, how can I talk about this ongoing thing with this? Being this person who I can't see, but who I sense, who I sense is around me. I mean, because most people have a sense that there's something more mm-hmm. than what they can smell and touch and feel, etc. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, well, if you if you help them read through Romans uh, one, uh, that, that without a Bible you can still know that there's something greater than you uh, behind it all. You may not be able to, to fill out or fill in the blanks. Mm-hmm. But that's obvious there. But I love what you're saying about Genesis 1. I mm-hmm. really, really think that's key. But then also with Ken, I rush right over mm-hmm. to Genesis 3 and talk about the four things I call the fallout of the fall. Mm-hmm. We're unplugged from God. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we're unplugged from ourselves. Therefore, we are unplugged from people. And everything on the planet has been thrown off kilter. So we have hurricanes, tsunamis, cancer, etc. And to me, if you don't have that backdrop, there's no way in the world you're going to understand what's going on today. So, so I mean, this is the groaning creation that Romans yeah, eight talks sure, about. Right. And it longs for redemption, and and yet at a personal level, we need the redemption that God offers. And and I think the backside of that conversation is. Is the point that's already been made, which is, and you can't fix it yourself. Yeah. So I mean, because most people, you know, we have we have a thing in our culture that says, you know, you got to be this great independent who can fix things on your, you know, if you if you just want something bad enough and pursue it persistently enough, you can get there. That kind of thing, and and it's just not true. Yeah, and I think and I think Ken and I would both agree with this. I think that how you say what you say. Is really just as important as what you say. Oh man, you're right. And I think yeah. we can just absolutely bomb out uh-huh. if we come with people beating them over the head with the Bible instead of caring for them and letting the Holy Spirit work it in through us and then getting to the content. But I think the question that I've kind of learned to ask over the years uh, with people that um, seem like they're stiff arming God. Mm-hmm. But really, most of them are, are – most of those people, most people, I think, just don't have in, correct information. And so they throw the baby out with the bathwater. So here's the question I like to ask. I'll get to know a person, ask a little bit about their life, and usually it's crumbling somewhere mm-hmm. in their life. Yeah. So here's the question. 
well, how's that working for you? Yeah. It ain't working. Yeah. And so if there was a solution, would you like one? Well, who wouldn't? Yeah. And then I start laying out who Christ is, what he did, why he did it, why we need it, how we get it. Boom. Uh, it's not very different than the conversation I have. I often say we have to translate our theology in a way that someone can understand. Yeah. yeah. And then and then I'll be honest with you, I like to finesse I like to finesse the problem. Okay. And the way I like to finesse the problem is to say, all right, so if I say the word sin, I, I call it the Star Wars defense. The Star Wars defense goes up. They don't hear sin, they hear sin. In, and yeah. this phaser oh, yeah. shield goes yeah. up. You know, it's a mile yeah. high and you know, ten miles deep. And so, how do you do that? But if I approach them and say something like, "Your life is dif- dysfunctional," which is your question, mm-hmm. is it working for you? Okay, that's even a better way to say it in many ways. Is your life dysfunctional? Yeah. I get what I call a confession, and, I, and then I joke, "We have a Catholic moment," okay, because they've mm-hmm. confessed. All right, yeah. and then I say. So And then I begin to explain to them, that's part of what the Bible calls sin. That dysfunction is a product of sin, okay? And I work my way to the biblical concept, but I've already gotten them to take a step in the direction of saying, we need to have this conversation. And, uh, and so that, that's one of the ways that I think about, you know, translating our theology so it connects with someone at a place where they can connect with you've built that bridge and then you can go you can take the next steps you're doing the yeah. same thing yeah. by what the questions yeah, sure. you're asking sure. we often we often uh have people who will push back some mm-hmm. because their definition of sin is I'm as bad as I could be or I'm as bad as the worst person I know. Yeah. I'm, right. I'm not Adolf Hitler or whatever. I'm not that bad. Not that bad. And, yeah. and I often say, look, if, if we could do a videotape of your life the mm-hmm. next month, would mm-hmm. you want your family to come to that? And yeah. some of them say, well, yeah, it's not too bad. I said, if we could add a track on that that Let's us see everything you think about for a month. Yeah. Well. How many people? And what about if we could take a track of every motivation for all the good things you do? And by the time you get to that point, I, you say that's how God sees everything, and God has a a verdict not about you alone, but me and everybody else. We're sinful. We're all we're, in the same boat. We're in the same boat. Yeah. yeah. And they will say, well, you Christians think that you're better than us. Oh, no, no. We I could mean, be worse. No, no, no. Right. Here's the deal. I am right. not better than anybody, mm-hmm. right. but I am desperate enough to know that I don't need a religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a thousand of them out there. I need That's a right. Savior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and Jesus is the only Savior I think the world's ever heard about. And, and so that's sort of the way we oh, try no, to frame it and can I in think terms of, of, of the fact that we're all in the same yeah, boat. And exactly. there's only one option because yeah. Jesus truly is the only Savior the world is ever, certainly the only risen Savior the world's ever heard about. The reason you need a Savior is because you realize you can't save yourself. That, right? that, that's, that's, when you get that's, to that uh, yeah. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. People start twitching. When you start saying it's it's exclusive, it's one way. I say, yep, that's right. But let's look at why. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes, like you said, the religions, I said most people think now you're really putting down those people. I'm putting them down. I'm worse than all of them. Mm-hmm. But I have an answer that they don't have. One of the views of traveling around the world, you get to talk to Buddhists and yeah. and, yeah. and 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 all kinds of folks. I was flying from Dharamsala, where I was teaching nearby, back to Delhi, and a guy who was the athletic trainer at MIT. Was on the phone, was on the plane, and sitting next to me, and he had been at the Dharamsala's compound for a month as a mm. sabbatical. Yeah. Mm. And and my question to him, he was telling, I said, "Tell me about what you believe." And I always do that. And they mm-hmm. they talk a while, and then I I said he brought about brought up about making progress toward the 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 place of blessedness that he was hearing about, and I said, "You're 30 years old, and in your view, you don't know how many times you've been on this drill." But I said. Are you making progress? Are you closer at thirty than you this time than you were in the times you can't remember before? How, you know, how much progress are you making toward that end result so far in these thirty years? Yeah. And he says, "Not very good." Yeah, not very mm-hmm. good. I said, "That's why I couldn't believe what you believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There would be no good, hope Ken. for me, mm. and I need hope. Mm. Yeah. And Jesus is the only hope I got." Mm. So well, one of the questions, if ahead. I could just yeah, for ten seconds, one yeah. of the questions I often open up for people that um, and present that I don't know well, I just well tell me your tell me your faith journey. Mm-hmm. Just give me something. Yeah. I, you can tell in two minutes. Yeah, if they know the Lord or don't know him from Donald Duck. I mean, boom. Yeah. 
And if I, they and if they come from another background, I say, tell yeah. me about that. Yeah, let tell them, about it. Let yeah. them talk to you uh, about uh, what I'm they think. I'm so glad y'all went. And that here. opens it all up. I, You're right. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you went here because what we talk about regularly here is we talk about when you meet someone who hasn't, who likely hasn't walked into a church or doesn't have a church background, you don't even know what they know about Christianity. You want to get what I call a spiritual GPS reading on them. Mm-hmm. The only way you can get a Good. spiritual GPS <clears throat> reading on them is to be able – is to ask them questions and let them tell their story. Yep. And I say, when you first are engaging in evangelism, you have all the stuff you want to say to them. Put put your – I said, put your doctrinal meter on mute. I right. said, don't turn it off. And you're not going to be able to do that anyway. Yeah. I said, but put it on mute and just listen for a while. Let them tell their story. Let yeah. them tell you your background. I like to share the story of, uh, of my grandmother-in-law. You know, my grandmother-in-law um, – I, I, I like to joke, if you think a mother-in-law is a challenge, a grandmother-in-law is a real challenge. And so, um, and, and she grew up – now, she did grow up in a, in a Christian home, put it in quotes. Dad was uh, attended a Baptist church, et cetera, but he also had, was very, very abusive. It, event, it led to a divorce mm-hmm. in the family, et cetera, despite all his, his attendance at church. <clears throat> so for her, when she heard the word Christian, she heard the word hypocrite. Wow. Yep. Okay? Yep. So that – colored any discussion that we walked into about the Christian faith. When I, when I discovered that, okay, I changed the way I had the conversations sure. with her because I knew I had I had this barrier that had been built hmm. that had that we had to work around and through in order to have those kinds of conversations. And so, you know, so she was having trouble understanding why I was giving my life to what I was giving it to given what her experience was, mm-hmm. which uh, to me, once I knew that that was part of that, well, I, I think I get this now, you know. And, and so that spiritual GPS reading tells you what they're thinking, what they know about Christianity. I tell people, if you want to know what someone thinks about Christianity, never darken the door of the church. They have two sources and two sources only, the people they know who call themselves Christians mm. and what they've heard in the culture. Yeah. And I say, how many of you want your definition of Christianity to come from either of those yeah, two sources? Yeah, very good. And yeah. so, that's great. so that's the challenge of the space. So getting to know someone and getting a read on where they're coming from and thinking about – what in their story can build a bridge to what it is that God is offering them through the gospel? That's yeah. what you're looking for. Exactly. In fact, in our discipleship process, 18 conversations, uh-huh. the, the conversations that, that Young Life Navigators, everybody d- deals with, with right. a few others, mm-hmm. right. uh, we basically try to teach people a paradigm. And that is when somebody brings up something that has significance, not mm-hmm. necessarily spiritual, right. affirm their willingness to talk about it. Right. They're taking a risk to exactly even talk right. about anything. It's a and then after you've affirmed it, you ask them a question. Get yeah. some understanding. It matters whether you're talking to a Buddhist or a Baptist. That's right. And once you've affirmed that and asked some questions, give just enough of your a good answer to ask them another good question. Mm-hmm. Because our basic principle is that when somebody else is talking about what they think, they are learning more than when you're talking about what Adam. you think, even yeah. if it's the world's best answer. That's good, John. That's because great, because yeah. they are actually processing it. And something that they thought was clear and settled, as they begin to talk about it, what was rock solid between the ears unravels mm-hmm. out of the mouth. Mm-hmm. And you don't jump on and prove the point. Right. You gently give them a sort of a redo and let them keep talking. And so that whole thing of cultivating conversations, my experience having worked with Doctors, lawyers, engineers, seminary students, yeah. pastors, yeah. all kind of people. People that are well educated have been taught to answer questions mm-hmm. and they struggle to ask good questions. Mm-hmm. No, it, it's and that's the key. And, to and good so if questions. you can ask good questions yep. and and have an affirming attitude, of course that works in parenting and marriage and every other relationship yeah. too. But but that's a key part of these kinds of conversations. And what sometimes will happen because you've opened up that space and you've taken the initiative of letting them speak, at some point they'll yeah. turn around to you and say, Well what what do you think? Exactly right. Yeah. Or what tell yeah. tell me your story. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah, and I think and I think we have to remember, even when we don't say the words exactly right, we use the wrong approach. I think if the heart's right and we're trying to get people to Jesus, I think I think the Lord works in and through all that mm-hmm. to bring clarity. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I've bungled it so many times and the person sitting there said, 
I think I want that. Mm-hmm. You do? <laughs> I was thinking about, while y'all were talking, I was thinking about a real good businessman buddy of mine over Mississippi. We do, we're doing a lot of stuff over all over that state with discipling and reaching people and the black-white issue, mm-hmm. which is tense at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my buddy has a farm, and he said he was um, – the, uh, one of uh, he had to get this tree that had fallen down, and so he went into this little town nearby his farm, and got three guys uh, that said, "Yeah, he." I said, "I'll pay you if you'll come cut the tree up, and get out of here." So he felt compelled. He said to share the gospel with them after they were all done. He said, "Y'all go sit down over here for a minute." <laughs> so he said, "So when you die, you're going to heaven." And these old real old country boys, uh-huh. salt to the earth, and this uh-huh. is what they said. One of them said. He said, you know how to get there. One boy said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Other one said, I don't know and I want to know. <laughs> Other one said, I know I'll make it. He said, how do you know you'll make it? Well, I did eat goats and sheep, and I know I'm going to make it. What's that mean? Yeah, yeah. So, again, you got all kinds of stuff going on right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's again, it's it's the relational <laughs> element, and sheep. it's and it and it and where we started is important here, and that is how you how you present yeah. the gospel tells people signals what what they're in for. Yeah. Okay. If they if they embrace the move, and so if. I, I've always react to the question: If you died today, would you know you're going to heaven? Because I think that's presenting the gospel as if it's a box that I check and I'm and I'm done. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting here going, No, God, you don't you don't respond to the gospel to avoid a place. You respond to the gospel to gain a person. That's right. Hmm. And so that's, I agree with that. If you're going to gain a person, and what better person to gain than the yeah. person who yeah. created you, who knows how you're made, who knows how you yeah. tick? Etc. And I know Ken. Mm-hmm. I know Ken well enough, and and his material, and his heart, and his life. He's going to focus on Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I think when a person is is introduced to this magnificent person, Jesus, mm-hmm. there's something very magnetic the Lord does to pull that person to Himself. Mm-hmm. And I want to just go back for ten seconds okay. to the way you started uh-huh. a while ago. Uh-huh. Is what what is the if you go to Genesis one. And I jumped over to uh-huh. John from there. Uh-huh. Eternal life, John seventeen three, that they may know you, yep. the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's a relationship. Yep. And it's, and it's not like, it's not like any other relationship you ever have in your life. And I don't think people think that way. But when they are introduced to that thought, I can have a relationship with the God of the universe through His Son. Whew. And our That's first strong. step after a person trusts Christ is not to give them a list of things they got to do because sure. they have spent their whole life living by the flesh. <laughs> right. And right. you give people a list, they'll, they'll try to do that list, yep. good list, things right. you ought to do yeah. in the flesh, and they're going to be off in the weeds spiritually. And so yeah. I, I try to say, how would you build a friendship with somebody you just met? Mm-hmm. That's right. Now, the things we want them to do are very analogous to, mm-hmm. you know, Spending time in the Word, prayer, spending time with people that know Jesus. I mean, there's, but you yeah. you frame those in relational yes. terms and as a privilege, not as a list of things, yeah. an obligation to do. Because my experience I was that I, they gave me the list and I did a pretty doggone good job yeah. at it, but I wasn't enjoying it. And even once I began to understand living by faith, the 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 reality is that. That if we're not intentionally depending on God, we are inevitably depending on ourselves. And the thing that confused me was if I'm doing the right thing, how can it be wrong? How can yeah. it be wrong? Yeah. <laughs> and and yet good. if you're doing the right thing yep. in the flesh, the yep. Bible says that's sin. And it doesn't mean God's not good. able to use it in other people's lives. It just means you're not going to enjoy it. And the way you know you're doing it in the flesh, in my experience, and I think in Philippians and other mm-hmm. places, there, there are three key things that are indicators, sort of tales in gambling terms, that you're doing it in the flesh. And that is you're anxious mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it sort of depends on you. You probably ought to be yeah. anxious. Yeah. You're angry because other people aren't lining aren't up like behaving. you wanted to. <laughs> and you're arrogant if it goes well. And mm-hmm. those are the three wow. big things wow. that great. Christians struggle with mm-hmm. that – that can be experienced in the midst of all the religious activity that the church and many ministries tell them to do, 
but they're not going to experience the kind of joy that God uses as a magnet to people that aren't Christians yet. Yeah. That's great. That's very I, good. I, I, and, and you were tying loose threads. So I want to go back and tie a, a loose thread. Sure. Since you brought up Genesis, uh, John 17, 3, I want to go back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1 says that we're made in the image of God, but we're made male and female. I want, I want, to, get, I want to get beyond the idea that salvation is just about me and my God. And because because of the way Genesis one works, Genesis one says we're created male and female, and that I like to remind people, creation didn't get promoted from good to very good until we had both male and female in the image of God. Mm -hmm. They were designed to cooperate with one another so that the so that they would subdue the earth well. Mm -hmm. The assignment was to fill the earth and to subdue it. So they were supposed to cooperate with one another in a way that made the world functional. Okay, that made the world function smooth. I like to joke that we're designed to be collaborators. We're designed to make the creation hum. We're designed to be hummers. And so we're mm -hmm. supposed to help make mm -hmm. creation hum. And, and then what sin does is it creates the dysfunction. So right. it breaks up. So when you love God and are properly related to him, it's no accident that the commandment that he says is the great commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself because you are designed to contribute to the creation in that kind of a way. Mm -hmm. You know, or another way to like to say it is, is you know, people say, "Well, I want to find love in the world. I want love in the world to be well." Um, wonderful goal, okay? How do you get there? Yeah. You get there by what God provides and by understanding how you were made and how you were made to love well, and and, and that the and that the Spirit of God. This is the thing we haven't talked about yet, but it's important. What 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 fixes you, if I can say that, is not just the forgiveness that you receive, but the Spirit of God that indwells That's you, right. that now gives you an enablement and a capability that you previously yes. didn't have and couldn't have without Him. Right. Yeah. And that's the source of the life that then yeah. feeds into the discipleship. And, and the Genesis one passage is where all these gender issues have to be addressed because it's diversity. Exactly. Let us make man in our image, right. embracing unity, right. unleashing creativity, and that's true in a marriage. That's true in the Everything. church. That's true. Yeah. No, that in is the that is that is the period. fingerprint yeah. of yeah. of God in all creation. Diversity, embracing unity, unleashing creativity. Yeah, that's great, and that that really is foundational to to. The kind of fruitful ministry God's called us to. It, it, it's foundational to virtually every relationship that we're yeah. ever in. And yeah. so, you know, you talk about the abundance of the life, and do, you can try and do the right thing, but you don't have that sense of abundance and joy that comes with it. And and the reason is because you're still disconnected. You're still disconnected to the walk and relationship with God that you yeah. need to, that you yeah. need to have. We we're, our time is flying. I mean, I'm looking at the clock, and and we are don't we have having fun yet? I'm having good, I'm having so much good time. But we've talked all about evangelism. We barely we have a, barely touched on discipleship. So in the time that we have left, let's let's dump as much on the discipleship side as we can before we have to wrap up. So let me talk about that. So so someone comes to the Lord. They're walking in. Yeah. You've got this mentoring, this side by side. I'm assuming. That part of the principle of mentoring is is the modeling that's offered to someone about the journey it's as the foundation. Doing, exactly it's right. The foundation. Sometimes call it modeling. Some people call it mentoring, depending on how you set it up. Sometimes it's seen. Well, you have more experience than I do, so I need to think about who you are. Sometimes it's done as modeling. We're just going to walk side by side as brothers. However, however that works. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what? What what's on the other side? What's on, what what's the discipleship? Well, Ken's like? older than I am, so I'm gonna let him go first. Okay, all right, that was gracious. Well, our our approach is basically we want to help a person learn how to begin a relationship with Christ, mm -hmm. live by faith. Mm -hmm. We call it living in dependence mode, and mm -hmm. that that is a reflection of of confidence in the Word. It's a reflection of security and identity. Uh, and if a person is intentionally depending on God, he's going to be in a position where he's able to enjoy what God's prepared for him. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, We're saved by grace, not by works. No man can boast. But the very next verse, yep. it says that we're God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And from my perspective, mm -hmm. we have nothing to boast about 
in terms of the ministry. That's right. And because he gets the credit in us, he gets the credit in our circumstances, yeah. and the Holy Spirit's what empowers us. So it's faith from start to finish, and then, right. then the rest of our material is how do you strengthen that pattern of living by faith yeah. in all these other dimensions of life that people struggle with? How do you make decisions? How do you yeah. enjoy your shape? How do you uh, uh, study the Scripture? How do you pray? Those kinds of things, all of which can contribute to it, if done by faith, Fuel a life that is both pleasing to God and 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 influential and and fruitful with people. And another corporate aside, while you go are in Ephesians, and that is, if you ask, what's the first good work that gets defined by Ephesians two after Ephesians two ten? Mm. It's eleven to twenty two. It's the idea that God has taken people who are formerly estranged. Jew and Gentile, who did mm -hmm. not get along, and put them together in a reconciled relationship, mm -hmm. not only with God, but with each other. Yeah. And so if you pursue, in the context of love, this attempt to live out a life that is pursuing the best for people and the yeah, reconciliation right. for people, et cetera, you're right smack in the middle of what right God is about. Yeah. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and I, I think that's right. important because one of the things that I think we struggle with in the church, at least in America, is we have a very privatized faith. Yeah. We, 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 we walk, we mm. tend to want to walk alone. We tend to want to walk in, in a way where it's just about me and my God. I don't, I'm not thinking yeah. about other people. We don't think corporately naturally, and so we have to develop we have to develop that muscle because that muscle wasn't developed by our yeah, culture. That's right. And and so so it's thinking through those corporate dimensions of, of what's going on. So I have one other th thought real quick and that is this. It seems to me that the discipleship has kind of if I can say it this way, three elements. Your relationship with God, your connection to God's people, mm -hmm. and your interaction uh, with with God's revelation in His Word. So um, uh, there are probably more things than that, but it seems to me those are pretty good. So your relationship with God is going to involve you with prayer and your walk with God, your talk with God, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Your relationship to God's people is going to put you in a community mm -hmm. that you need to be functioning in. Mm -hmm. And your commitment to God wor is God's Word is what feeds you, what keeps you, mm -hmm. what helps to keep you alive with mm -hmm. the sustenance of the Spirit that's inside mm -hmm. of you yep. in order to walk. Now, am I missing anything? I'd say that, that that what we started talking about is uh -huh. that it, we're here as ambassadors of Christ <clears throat> to share the gospel. Okay. And so if we aren't really focusing on that relationship, and most Christians do not intentionally build relationships with folks that aren't Christians, and right. if you don't do it intentionally, yep. it won't happen. And okay. so, so I just think that, that that's a key part. So there's of, a missional element. There's a mission, and if you miss the missional element. You're missing out on well. You're missing out on the Great Commission because right, you got right. in order for a person to need to be baptized, they got to trust Christ, and and you're and you're back to so, Acts one. So, so. There, if I can say it this way, there's the personal nurture that those three things that I initially mentioned involve, but then there's the assignment that God gives us, the missional call that we have for why we are who we are and what we're supposed to be about, and mm -hmm. the way we're supposed to think about. Uh, engaging with people and really, love, I, I put the, I, I like to joke. The Great Commission and the Great Commandment are great because they're great. Yeah. You know, right. and which means they right. keep us, fo they keep us focused. And it's not just sharing the gospel. It's, it's, yeah. it's investing in people so that they're prepared to be multiplied. That's why I mentioned the Great Commandment because yeah. the Great Commandment is to love people. Okay, it's to care for them. Mm -hmm. It's to be engaged mm -hmm. with them. And that love is exceptional. That love is not just a love for the people who like us. Yep. Mm. That what makes it exceptional. The reason mm. Jesus says we're supposed to be different than everybody else is mm. because we have a love element that we're offering yeah. to people who don't normally get it, and that's your enemy. <laughs> and that that's the hard part. I'm sure John's fan, the people in the military yeah. who were the most hostile, mm -hmm. who would say awful things to me because I wasn't doing what they were doing. When I found out their daughter was in the hospital and I said, tell yeah. me about your daughter, can I pray? Yeah. Oftentimes the people yeah. most hostile – are people God's already working on? Yeah, He's already know. drawing them to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I uh, and but I but but my heart. I, I did lots of ministry. I was producing few multipliers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I've spent the last number of years trying to for myself and for other pastors and for lay people. Yeah. You don't have to go to seminary to have this much fun. No. I tell guys, mm -mm. I wanted to give them a resource that would give them an opportunity to be intentionally involved in both evangelism and launching what we call launching multipliers, 
because I think that's at the heart of, yeah, of sure. the mission we have. Yeah, that's the assignment. Fair How enough. much time I have left? Now go for it. you got a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, can we go over it all? Yeah, we can you go Splice little. and dice? Yeah, well. Well, I think the first thing, and again, Ken yeah. and I are so much on the same uh, page here, I think the reason we disciple mm-hmm. is because that's what Jesus said to do. Mm-hmm. Matthew 28, go therefore and make that's disciples. That's part of the Great Commission. Or as you are going, go back. And nobody on the mountain, when Jesus said that, none of the the disciples raised their hands and said, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. They knew what he was talking about. They had 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 it done to them. That's right. That's right. So that's the first thing. Second thing, as a lot of people I don't think know, we do because we've been around a while, we learned this stuff, but it was a command. It wasn't a suggestion. Mm -hmm. It was the imperative. Mm -hmm. I believe Jesus' strategy to change the planet Today mm-hmm. and tomorrow mm-hmm. is making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. But the question then is, what does it mean to make disciples, and what is one? Mm-hmm. And Ken and I would both tell you probably 260 sometimes, all depends what translation of the New Testament you read, uh, it, the word disciples used. Mm-hmm. The word Christians used? Three times. Mm-hmm. So if you put if you do your due diligence through all the, 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 the discovery in a funnel, out of the bottom of the funnel, drop three things it means. A disciple is a learner, mm-hmm. and as one of my uh, great impactors on my life said, true learning, biblically speaking, only happens when it changes my life. Mm-hmm. So just because I got the information doesn't mean it's changing me. Okay. My head's packed, but my life's not changing. Right. Number two, it's a follower. Mm-hmm. And the demands of following are very challenging. Mm-hmm. But the third part is where the church in our country has missed it, mm-hmm. for the most part. It's reproducing. Mm-hmm. And so if I were to put in a statement succinctly what I have for my life and others mm-hmm. to do this, my desire is to live by his priorities and to spend my life reproducing those priorities in the lives of others who were reproduced in others. And the priorities are simply, you mentioned already, Matthew 22. Mm-hmm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Second commandment is like the first, love your neighbors yourself. So I feel there, love God, love Christ, all the stuff you need to make it sizzle, the word, prayer, worship, all that stuff. I think a lot of evangelicals miss the second one, though. Mm-hmm. He says, love your neighbor as. It's a simile. Like her as, you love yourself. Mm -hmm. So what if I don't like me? Mm -hmm. It's going to hurt me caring for my wife, my kids, or anybody Mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. So we call the second one a commitment to loving yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, here's here's what's behind that. I'll only love someone else to the degree I love myself. And I'll only love myself to the degree I know how much God loves me. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, if I get that right, then I can begin off of that basis Mm -hmm. to develop, take care of myself physically, mentally, socially, and emotionally, Luke 2.52, same way Jesus went. And then the third priority is a commitment to other believers. Mm -hmm. Look at John 17. Francis Schaeffer taught me this years ago. He said, John 17, if we are not one as followers of Christ individually with other people, then we're going to be a barrier and a detriment to people in the world knowing Christ. So the body of Christ. And number four, the people that don't know God from Donald Duck, the Mm -hmm. lost. Mm -hmm. So those are the four things for 50 years in my own personal life I've tried to live by. And they would incorporate everything John's talking about. So just review it as a list. Huh? Just review it as a list. Just the list. Give us the list. Yeah, the first priority is a personal progressive commitment to Jesus Christ. Okay. Making sure you've got it, developing and growing it, and make it sizzle. Okay. Number two is a personal commitment to love on myself. Okay. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. Okay. Number three, a personal commitment to the body of Christ, Mm -hmm. other believers. Number four, a personal commitment to the work of Christ in a lost world. Okay. And then under each one of those, there are a lot of specific sure. areas and so sure. forth. Yeah. Okay. That's so we're saying the same thing. We're just using different jumping points and so forth. But yeah. But right. I, 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 what I love about what's being said is how outward it is. Yeah. You know, this is priority one's going to hap- It's going to go out. Exactly if you don't, right. if you get one right, yeah, and get that humming, as we would both know, yeah, it's going to how you look at you, how you look at others, and caring about. People that don't know anything about it. I used to say that the the arc of life that most of us have to live is we start with the arrow pointed at ourselves because we're the center of the world. 
and then God is doing this. <laughs> pointing you it outwards, it. you know, you got it. outwards and upwards. And that there's this little ethic, what I call the ethical triangle. There's this triangle that gets hmm. minute about how the way I relate to God is supposed to impact the way I'm relating to others. Yeah. And then the way I like to say this for evangelism, I like to play with John 3.16 yeah. and shorten it and say it this way. God so loved the world that he gave. End of verse. And so the point is – That's great. The, the, the point is – and, and you think about the world that God is loving. It's not an attractive world. Yep. It's not a positive world. You know, it's the world with everything yep. that we know about it is wrong. But the way he gets there mm. – is that he gave. And then we come back to something that you mentioned earlier, John, which is the tone that we use is mm. as important mm. as the content that we yeah. have. Yeah. And it's that outwardness that is the draw. Yeah. Yeah. And we both do one-on-one -on -one discipleship yeah. because I'm convinced that people need to have an environment where they can ask their questions, where they yeah. can be honest. And it is more time intensive. Mm -hmm. But if you want to equip somebody to do something with other people, one on one's the simplest relationship. You do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and I, I it's worth my time having done lots of group things. I do group things too. I want mm -hmm. to help people make incremental progress toward maturity as much as possible. Yeah. But I, I think the intentional preparation of multipliers, for my money as a 71-year-old, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I don't have time to not make the most of my time. Interesting. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming in. Hey, we both have fun. more now. I know. I know. <laughs> well, think of this as part one, okay? That would be great. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would love and, that. Because this is, this is a good conversation, an important conversation. It's a conversation – the church needs and the, the whole idea of being able to move from starting from ground zero, mm. you know, to taking people to the full and abundant life is is the calling of the church. That's it's right. the calling of everybody in the church. It's not just the calling of the pastor. No. It's not just the calling of the parachurch ministries that reach out to exactly. people. It's the calling of every single one of us and getting equipped to do that fully so that you're walking with God in the way that draws people is important. I'll, I'll close with this observation, and that is that, that at least in most of the testimonies that I hear that come from people who did not grow up in a Christian home, mm -hmm. okay, so they didn't have it from their parents or whatever, the way, the way this works goes something like this. At some point in their life, they met a Christian hmm. who was authentic about their faith to one degree or another. Sure. Yeah. And you hear in the midst of that testimony, I met so and so, whatever, whoever it is, and something about their life caught my attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something yeah. about their life caught my attention. You said that to begin with. And yeah. I was curious yeah. about what that was, yeah. and that started them on the journey. Yeah. So you know, sometimes we think it's our words that that do it, but words may be the finisher. They may not be the starter. you got to let me say this. Okay. Someone yeah. said you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, uh -huh. but you can feed him salt and make him thirsty. <laughs> That's yeah. what our life should yeah. do. Yeah, right. interesting. Very good. We're called to be salt. We're called to be light. Right. You On got that it. note, we're out of here. We're out of okay? here. <laughs> all right. Let me thank you all for joining the table. and am glad you're a part of uh, this. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. And if you have an interest in the table, go to voice.dts.edu. You can see other podcasts we do. We cover an array of topics. Um, table. Welcome to the table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I like to say, I'm thinking in my head when I say that, we talk about anything and everything. So we're uh, real pleased that you could join us, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.